The text for this morning is going to be Luke chapter 5. We're going to be reading from the first almost dozen verses of this chapter in Luke. That's Luke chapter 5, and I'll give you a moment to find it. It's the story of Jesus calling his first disciples. Luke chapter 5. Beginning in verse 1, Scripture tells us, On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, this is the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little bit from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. Verse 6 tells us, and when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats both the boats, so they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be fishers of men. You will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time this morning as we seek to have him speak to our hearts. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for the privilege that it is to come before you, God. Lord, it is such an incredible thing to come before a holy God, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth, God. And uh, Lord, we thank you for Uh, the ability to freely gather this morning, Lord, to come as a congregation, Lord, brothers and sisters in Christ without the fear uh, hanging over our head, Lord. And we pray, Father, that this morning you may speak to our hearts, Lord, each and every one here, Lord, whether they know you or not, we pray that you might minister your gospel to us, that you may call us to faith in you, Lord, and to grow in sanctification day by day. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. This morning we have come together as the body of Christ with the purpose of gathering in the presence of God. We've gathered in the presence of God to worship him in spirit and in truth. Now we've just read about an account from God's word of what happened when Peter, James, and John, we know them as disciples, but this is when they're meeting Jesus for the first time. And the question that sears our heart as we have just finished reading God's word about how these men had their powerful, transformative encounter with Christ in his divinity, is whether we can rightly say that we have ourselves met with the divine. Do you believe that God is here today? Do you believe that God is here today? If we have met with him, if he is here, there should be signs that he is here. Now, I'm not talking about something mystical. This is not something superstitious, not emotional. It's not imaginary. But we should have some kind of confirmation because where God has been encountered, the reality of sin takes hold and the absolute necessity of the gospel is manifest. This is because the gospel does not call us to passive acceptance. It is calling us to an act of faith and a perfect Savior, to encounter God as these men did, and to realize his presence daily, and as we gather as the body of Christ, should radically transform our lives, and it should show in everything that we do, especially as we gather for worship. And as we undertake this task of examining this passage from Luke, we ask God to use these verses to show us what it means to repent, to show us what it means to have faith, to show show us what it means to say that we know Jesus Christ so that we may live with a greater appreciation of what it is to say God was here 
amongst the brethren to show us what it means to say that we truly know our Lord and Savior. Chapter 5 begins by telling us about the setting of this story. It gives us kind of an establishment here where this story is about to take place. Jesus has begun his earthly ministry, and we know he's getting quite popular by now because it tells us about the crowd that's pressing in upon him. So um, we can see here the setting is that there's this crowd that's following after Jesus to listen to him teach. And in the midst of all these people who had gathered to hear Jesus preach, they were there for a reason. They wanted to follow Jesus and to hear his words. We find a few individuals, at least three men, who were not like that. In the midst of all these people who had gathered to hear Jesus teach, we see three men, Peter, James, and John, and they had not come for the purpose of listening to Jesus. They had come as fishermen. They were just trying to make a living catching fish. Fish. And judging by the report here, they weren't doing a very good job, at least that night. But these are men who would become disciples of Christ. There are people who would become apostles. They would preach to thousands of people. Peter would be crucified for the, the cause of Christ. We know these men as disciples, but here they're simple fishermen. And so we ask, why does God encounter them here? Why does Jesus meet them here on the Sea of Galilee while they're doing their work? Why doesn't he meet them at their home? Why doesn't he meet them at the synagogue? Why doesn't he meet them somewhere else? Why does he meet them when they're sweaty and they've been toiling and they've been up all night trying to catch fish? They're pouring their sweat and effort into making a living. Well, when Peter, James, and John set out that morning, they had a purpose, and their primary concern was for their own short-term circumstances. The largest question that loomed in their minds was simply, can we catch any fish? And from our vantage point as readers, and we have this vantage point of time, and we see that we can actually turn our nose up at that. We can say, well, you know, they're about to hear God in the flesh, the Messiah, preach a message. And what are they thinking? They're thinking about fish. The very one who spoke the oceans and all breathing things into existence, that same voice is going to be echoing in their ears as they hear Jesus speak. And what are they thinking about? Fish. We can turn up our noses at this. Think how foolish. What foolishness is this? They're consumed with this idea that they need to catch fish and they're going to hear Jesus preach today. Their lives are going to be changed today. But let's not be so hard on these men. What captures our hearts so often but our short-term circumstances? Our immediate needs seem to grip our hearts as our greatest needs, whether this is true or not. You know how to spot a false teacher from a mile away? Well, they'll tell you That that car that you need, that financial peace that you desire, that retirement that you deserve is something that you can simply get if you ask for it because God wants to give you what you want. But do you know what happens to fish when it sits out in the sun? It rots to the bone. It stinks. Your greatest need is not for a thing in this world, your greatest need is for rescue. And this is where Jesus meets these men. Their greatest need that they felt was to catch fish. But he's going to show them their greatest need is for rescue from hell. And Jesus is going to perform a miracle here. We've already read and we understand he's going to perform an amazing feat, something that is supernatural. It demonstrates his divinity, but the purpose in having them catch all these fish was not to meet these disciples, Peter, James, and John, in their physical desires and to satisfy them in that way. The purpose was to reveal Jesus' divinity. The purpose was to reveal to them their own depravity, and the purpose was to call them to faith and to serve the only one who could save them from the consequences of sin in a very real place called hell. So this is where Jesus meets them. It's not incidental. It's not to be overlooked. He meets them on the Sea of Galilee, where their primary concern is for fish. And my intent is not to trivialize the practical needs that we have, because we do have very practical needs in our lives. 
We seek for shelter for our families. We need to have a job so we can provide food for our families and provide clothes for ourselves. I'm not trying to minimize or belittle the practical needs that we have. But I'm, what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to communicate is that however vast our felt needs are, we have an ever more tremendous spiritual need that can only be met by faith in Christ. We realize that we are in the same boat, no pun intended, with these fishermen. And we see so often our felt need, but when we look at it from the vantage point of sinners who are dying in need of a Savior, all of those things turn to fish. All of those things that we think are so important, they fade away because they rot and they stink. But there's something eternal to be found in Christ alone. These men had planned, had not planned rather, to encounter Christ, but they were about to. They were about to, and this would come to define who they are. Verse 3 tells us, getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we told all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. In these verses we see a focus upon the interaction that occurs between Peter and Jesus. Simon is the word that's used here quite a bit, because obviously we realize that Peter was the name that was given to Simon. But this is Peter here, and he's interacting as this primary figure. We're given the names of James and John here, but primarily we're seeing this speaker being Peter, and are we really surprised that it's Peter who's speaking up after all? He's, he's known for that. But we see this primary interaction between Jesus and Peter. Jesus comes to Peter and he asks Peter, can I use your boat? There's a huge crowd following Jesus and he's going to use the boat as a platform to speak from. This would have been a way for Jesus to speak to a large group more effectively. He used it as a platform. We see him do this other places in scripture as well. So it, it was a, maybe a common technique for a teacher who had a large group of people around him. But he asked Peter to do this, and Peter allows Christ to use his boat, and we're going to presume that he listens to Jesus teach as well. After all, he's using his boat, and he's, he's here. And afterwards, what does Jesus say? He tells Peter to go fishing. And Peter has already said, or he's going to tell him, well, we fished all night long. But Jesus tells Peter to go fishing. And his reaction is, Master, we have toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. You see, the miracle that's about to happen tells us a lot about Jesus and who he is. But Peter's response tells us as much about who he is. It's interesting. Did you catch what he calls Jesus here? Peter responds by addressing Jesus in a very important way. He calls Jesus master. Now what could possibly, what could Peter possibly mean by calling Jesus master? This is before he's a disciple. Is Peter a Christian here? Is Peter a follower of Christ, a believer? And they come as a surprise to you, but I'm going to answer no here. Peter is not a, not a disciple yet. He's not a Christian yet. He's not a follower of Christ yet. And I'll explain why. But he doesn't, doesn't he call Jesus master? Doesn't he follow Christ's command? Doesn't he show that he has faith in what Jesus has told him to do? Certainly I must be wrong about him being saved. But we understand here that the word master should be understood as a title of respect. It's simply calling Jesus a teacher. And we have to give him credit that he, he does follow what Jesus says. He does have a kind of faith. He was able to acknowledge him in a, in a way that shows he, he is superior to himself. But we know that Peter is not yet aware of Jesus's divinity because of the reaction that occurs after the miracle. 
So even though Peter has a kind of faith here, we know that he is not a believer. Because you see, there is a kind of faith that does not save. This is very important. There is a kind of faith that does not save. Because God calls us to faith, not just blindly, not just in the person who bears the name Jesus Christ, but in the God-man Jesus Christ. To faith in the divine man Jesus Christ. The faith that is described in um, Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. It is not from, yourse- not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone can boast. That is not a peanut butter kind of faith that you spread around to fit in the nooks and crannies where you feel you need to. Because before we can find faith that brings salvation, we must understand what we're being saved from. We cannot have saving faith if we don't know what we're being saved from. You see, up until this point, Peter still sees his need, still sees his greatest compelling desire as catching fish. Well, Jesus, if you tell me that I can go catch some more fish, I'll go out for you. I respect you. You're a teacher. I'll give it a try. But you see, he doesn't understand yet that this man who he's talking to, who's commanding him here, he doesn't need to just catch more fish by his command. He needs to be saved by this man. Because his pressing need is not just to catch fish. His pressing need is that he is on his way to hell and judgment before God. He doesn't understand who Jesus is yet. And what a terrifying place to be at. Do you know who Jesus is? Not have you called him master. Peter calls him master. But do you know who Jesus is? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 tells us, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Does Peter sound like he knows that he's talking to the only one who can save them from this fate? Not yet. He doesn't know who Jesus is. So we must understand that there cannot be redemption. We cannot find salvation unless we know the truth, both about about who Christ is and about who we are. And this is not to say that the gospel and the acceptance of the gospel is an intellectual accomplishment because it is not an intellectual accomplishment to come to saving faith in Christ. But it requires, it absolutely requires an understanding of truth. And we must understand this. When we share the gospel with other people, do we provide them with enough truth to come to salvation? You see, people can, you can turn on the TV and find people who are preaching the name of Jesus, but they don't include enough information for someone to be saved. They need to know. Anyone who is saved needs to know what it is that they need to be saved from and who the person of Jesus Christ is. Not just the man, but the God-man. Peter doesn't know this yet, but he's about to. But can you see where we, we act like Peter? And we say, well, Lord, I'll do what you say if you can get me what I want. Do we ever do this with God? Do we ever bargain with God? So, well, well, God, I, I'm, I can do this if you'll only bless me in this way. We so often hear that in, in dire circumstances. And, but we don't need, ultimately, in those circumstances, even the most tragic and dire, we don't just need a rescue from our situation. We need a rescue from sin. We don't just need someone to give us what we want. We need a savior from sin. And that's who Jesus is. He's not one to capitalize upon, to get what your heart's desires in the flesh are. He is one to cling to in order to save your soul from judgment. So it's vital to know that salvation does not come from a mere reverence of God. Salvation does not come from obedience to the law of God. Salvation is found by turning from sin and placing your faith in the Son of God. He has poured out his blood for salvation, and only through faith in him can we find our rescue from sin, 
not just our circumstance. And we cannot understand what this faith is until we know how lost we are without Christ. And this is what Peter is about to see. And it's a dramatic moment to say the least. Verse 6 in the fifth chapter of Luke tells us, and when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to the partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down on Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. See, I began this morning by asking us the question, a rhetorical question, have we encountered God? Because this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like to encounter a holy God. When Jesus causes this miracle to occur, Peter realizes for the first time that he's not just speaking with a mere teacher, he is speaking, he is kneeling at the feet of God himself. And when we stand uncovered before God, our sin is like an exposed wound. And to know Christ as he truly is exposes us to the realization of our sinful hearts. If we're going to encounter Christ, it's not all going to be a wonderful feelings as we go through the process of, of meeting him. We must, as we encounter Christ, realize the desperation of our situation. And if we have met with Christ, if we encounter him, the reality of our sin is lifted up as God's holiness is lifted up. Remember Isaiah, who, te- who, who talks about in, in the book of Isaiah, how he was shown a vision of Christ. He meets the king of kings in the temple. And what does he say? Woe to me, I cried, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king, the glory of the King, the Lord Almighty. You see, when Christ is encountered, the blackness of our soul is revealed in the most crushing and disturbing way. The cursed evil of sin that taints our relationship with God demands that we be forever estranged from our Lord. That's what sin means to us when we see the perfection of Christ. And Peter's sudden awareness of his wickedness, it's so overwhelming that what does he say? Isn't it amazing what his reaction is? It's very similar to the prophets. He says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. You see, Peter's encounter with Christ did not bring about his personal comfort in that moment. Because before, we, we emphasize in the process of, of coming to salvation, I think so many times, the reconciliation that comes with Christ because of his blood, but we do not realize that before we can have a reconciliation, we must come to a realization that we are desperately wicked. Not just kind of bad, not just, well, I'm not bad enough not to get into heaven, but so overwhelmingly wicked that if we were to meet Christ uncovered, we would say, go away, God, I can't take it. You're too holy. I'm too wicked. We need a covering for our sin. If someone says that they have found God but never experienced the conviction of their vile sinfulness and the truth that they are condemned to hell, they're either a liar or deceived in their thinking. It must happen. It must be highlighted when we come to Christ. And even as believers, we have to have this realization. When we come to sing hymns of God's holiness, does it not reflect upon our lives? Do we not, as we sing those words of praise to God, see, I am a sinful man. I only can come before the Father through the blood of Christ. That's the only way that we can come together here. That's the only way that we can come and worship here. And even for the believer, we must return to the truth that we are but lowly sinners, saved by God's incredible grace. We were in the most dire of circumstances, the most incredible of dire circumstances that you could possibly imagine, and yet we were sustained by God's mercy. 
And when we look at our situation as Christians that way, it changes the way that we look at our struggles. How can we weather this or that storm within the church? How can we make it through? How can we overcome it? The situations look dire. Well, look to the cross. There's your answer. An empty cross that bears the truth of a victorious Lord and Savior. If you look, go into a Catholic church, you will see that Jesus is still on the cross for them. Ours is empty, and it's not a a stylistic choice. It is a choice because we believe that our Savior is no longer upon the cross. He's no longer in the grave. He is risen and victorious. And because of his victory, we may overcome our adversaries in any circumstance. But we can be like the Israelites so often, can't we? They were rescued from Egypt. They were delivered from their persecutors, those who had enslaved them. But so quickly, they forgot that which form they were rescued, and they turned to doubt and complaining. But let's remember who we were, where we were rescued from. The pit of hell is where we deserve to be, and yet God has given us his mercy. Let's remember where we once were. Perhaps grief has taken hold of your heart as you mourn the loss of loved ones or choices of those that you love, and you ask, how can I carry on with such pain? Look at the cross. There's one who bore the sin of the world, and he's able to carry you through your sorrow. His love and compassion can bear you up and bring you peace that surpasses understanding. Look to the cross. Maybe you have broken relationships with fellow Christians or family members, and sin has tainted a friendship or a bond, and forgiveness is hard, as it often is. What should we do? We look to the cross. The one who bore the sin of the world is able to carry you through that trial as well. He gave himself as a, as a sacrifice for forgiveness of sin that was so infinitely evil because it was against an infinitely perfect God. And how can we remain bitter in the light of the cross when we have been so forgiven against our sin and shown such an overflowing mercy by our Savior? We look, to find, we look to Jesus, and we find our rest. As Peter has become aware of his sinfulness and Christ's perfection, an incredible thing happens in verses 10 and 11. It says in verse 10, And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, don't, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Do you think Peter was surprised at the response of Christ? Do you think Peter was surprised to hear Jesus say these words? His extension of mercy and grace And should we not also be so surprised to hear this? Because Jesus could have said to Peter, as he's told Jesus, go away, I'm a sinful man. He could have told Peter, no, you shall depart forever from my eyes, for you are a sinful man. And he would have had full authority and power to do this. But instead he demonstrates mercy. He calls these men forth from sin to walk in grace worked out through faith in Jesus. Leave everything and follow me. They left all that they had. What did they leave on the banks of that sea as they followed Christ? They left all their fish. All of those things that they had woken up that morning thinking this was their pursuit, this was their desire, this is what they needed, this is what would bring them peace and wealth and stability, they left it all because that fish would rot and turn to dust. But Jesus offered them something far greater. He offered them eternal life. He offered them mercy. We must leave that which we cling to and cling only to Christ. So beautifully been put, empty-handed we cling to him. We can't 
hold on to the things of this world and also hold on to Christ. We leave it all and we follow our Savior. What about our possessions? What about our desires, our pursuits? We leave the fish behind and we follow the one who can give us life abundantly. Paul put it so wonderfully in Philippians chapter 1 when he told us, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. That's how we're to think. Not to cling to the things of this world, but to cling to Christ because he's the only one who can change our hearts. He's the only one who can transform our lives. And he calls us to repent, to turn away from that which has held our heart and to follow him, to let Christ hold our hearts. This is what it means to encounter Christ. The question that we began with was, have we encountered Christ? We know these men did. We know that they, they were changed forever. They preached the word of God. They saw thousands of people come to salvation because of the ministry that God used them for. But it started here, when they were called by God. They encountered Christ in his divinity. Have we encountered Christ, the God-man? in our lives? Do we see these same characteristics being worked down in our hearts? Perhaps it is a memory for us instead of a reality in our lives. Return to this gospel because it is what gives us life. The gospel is not to be remembered as something we once experienced. It is something that saves us each and every day. It is working out our salvation and we cling to the cross not simply as a a memory that we walked down an aisle and we chose to do this one thing at a certain time, it is something that we cling to each and every day. As we come to realize, I feel as we grow in Christ, we become, have a greater awareness of our own evil. We don't see ourselves in a better light, we see ourselves in a worse light. And as we see our sin before, set before us, we realize God's grace is even greater than I ever could have imagined. When I came to Christ, I only, only thought I had a few problems with my life, but I knew it condemned me before hell. And so I cling to Christ, but now I see, oh God, I am such a wicked man, and I must cling to you evermore because I don't deserve your mercy. And we answer the call of Christ. Lord, I will follow you. Lord, I cannot bear to be within your presence if I'm not covered by your mercy, if I'm not covered by the blood of Christ and if we do not have the blood of Christ upon us, we will one day not be able to say, Lord, depart from me, but he will tell us, depart from my presence. I didn't know you. And what a terrible, terrible thought that is to think. But we must repent. We must have a change take place in our lives. That's what gives vitality to our Christian walk. It's what gives vitality to our church. We want to see a vibrant church life returns to the gospel because the gospel will make servants of us all. The gospel will make evangelists of us all. The gospel will make godly men and women of us all because it turns our hearts and minds to the object of our faith once again. As Jesus Christ compels us to follow him and we realize that calling each and every day that we live, that we may follow our Lord and Savior we may be his disciples. We may be his disciples not just for this time here on earth, but we may be his children, his loved ones, his brothers and sisters in Christ for all eternity. If we would only repent, place our faith in him, and leave all that we have an empty-handed cling to the cross of Jesus Christ.